last lecture. In particular, I want to address the question of the projection being independent of coordinates. So this relatively simple argument that I can give you that shows that in fact the projection is independent of the choice of orthogonal basis. So I'll show it to you. So suppose we have a subspace W. Subspace W of Rn. And we have two bases. Beta, let's say V1 through Vk. And gamma, let's say W1 through Wk. So these are both orthonormal. Which, of course, is most elegantly um, expressed in the formula, the simple formula, Vi and the product Vj is product for delta ij, and wi in a product wj is product for delta ij, simply meaning that <coughs> it's zero if they're, if they're distinct elements of the basis, and it's one if they're the same element, which is to say that they both have length, say every element of the basis has length one, hence the term normal. Well, <coughs> I will remind you that on the one hand, we have the projection, so the projection formula, I said projection of w, um, on x, well, what's that equal to? It's, it's equal to, well, <clears throat> it's equal to, let's see here, um, you know, it's equal to the sum, this is how I define it, sum j equals 1 to k of the inner product of what was it? It was a uh, quick work. Uh, yeah, I put x, x comma um, bj, and then dj again. So, but as I said, there's a question: Why is that? You know, why does it give you the same thing if you use the other basis, right? So I don't want to assume the point. So we need to come up with a different notation for the other basis. Let's say, just for temporary purposes, let's say that the projection w, um, and let's say tilde for the other basis, just to have a notation, is the sum j equals one to k of uh, x um, wj, wj. So the question is, why is the projection equal to the tilde projection? And why are these, in fact, the same function? Now, I tried to do something with matrices last time. But I think that's the wrong way to go. And um, so there's a better way of proving things. And this is something I really should emphasize more to you guys, especially as we hit harder problems like this. It's often wise to try to prove something with respect to a basis, right? So. If I try to prove this with respect to a basis, it's much, much easier. So, for example, here, the projection um, of W of, let's say, <coughs> Vi, what's it equal to? Well, it's equal to a sum, J equals 1 K of Vi and a product Vj, Vj, right? But this is exactly the chronic or delta, right? Ij. So this whole thing just breaks back down to what? Vi. Vi. Yeah. Right. However, right. And uh, here I'm, I, I do. Uh, on the other hand, we can expand. Vi. Vi is an element of the span. It's an element of the span of gamma. Right? So that means I can use that orthonormal basis expansion theorem that we proved the other day. And I can easily find the components of V sub i with respect to the gamma basis just by taking the inner products once more. What happens when you do that? In other words, I can say, aha, there's an identity. This is exactly the sum j equals 1 to k of the inner product of Zi with Wj, Wj. That is by the orthonormal basis coefficient theorem, where we prove that the coefficients in the linear combination that forms a span are exactly given by the dot products of the given vector with the given basis. OK, I proved it for all of Rn, but it certainly applies to a subspace just the same. The proof was not dependent on whether it was Rn or a subspace. It's still true for a subspace. But what's that? Just projection. It's the, the, 
then to tilt the projection in my current um, unnecessarily silly notation. The reason it's unnecessarily silly is because, as you can see, we have just proved that, in fact, the projection built from the beta basis is equal to the projection built from the gamma basis. It's as simple as that. Now, OK, you feel like, well, hey, wait, 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 that's a fast one. We only did it for the basis. What? I only did it for the basis of the subspace, right? I need that this identity is true for all vectors in the space. How do I get the rest? How about x that's not in W? extend the result to the whole space usually. And so it's, it's easier to work things out. And I invariably forget this and then suffer the consequences thereof. <laughs> so sorry to drag you into it. These things will happen. Yes. So you just said if we're trying to prove a property for a vector space, <coughs> you get the basis, prove the basis to extend. Sometimes. It's a useful thing. Alright, so yes. Okay, so I need to talk to you now about complex inner products. Complex inner product spaces. So what's a complex inner product space? It's an inner product basis. A oh, space made up of complex Right, so we have, first of all, a vector space over the complexes, right? And it's paired with what's called the Hermitian inner product. Like Hermit, with the in Hermitian, Hermitian inner product. Now the Hermitian inner product is a little bit different than the one we've dealt with so far. Let me show you how it works. So it's this function we usually use this the same notation usually used for it, and it it's, it takes in a, a pair of vectors. And here's the difference: it spits out not a real number but a complex number. All right. So in the, in the axioms that it must satisfy are A, um, <coughs> good gracious. By the way, this is on page 242 of the model of um, So A, for all U, V, and I'll give you that. I'm going to say for all X, Y, and Z. U, V, and W, you can hard to see the difference of when I'm writing the board. So for all X, Y, and Z, and A and B in the complexes, we have that the inner product of A, U, plus, ah, oh, gracious, adjusting, adjusting, A, X, <laughs> plus B, Y, comma, Z, is equal to, what's it equal to? It's equal to A, X, Z, plus B, Y, Z. So if I wanted to give this thing, I just wrote a label, I would call this linearity in the first slot. Linearity in the first slot. Okay. 
I mean, there are two slots in this, this inner product, right? There's the first slot, and then there's the second slot. So I just said it's linear in the first slot. Nice to have language for that. B is the surprising thing. So here's what B is. B is we have that x, y is equal to the conjugate of yx. In the real case, there's no conjugation there. It's just, you know, xy is equal to yx. Like the dot product is commutative. It's symmetric. So conjugate. And then also we have this sort of positive, not sort of, the positive definite thing. Um, if, if, if v is in v, um, then the inner product of v with v is greater than or equal to zero, and d with d is equal to zero, if and only if d is equal to zero. So a complex vector space with a Hermitian inner product is called a Hermitian inner product space. Yeah? Mike? What's the bar above the y-axis? Conjugation. Okay. So like, for example, um, in Cn, so complex n vectors, you could define the inner product of v and w as equal to, say, v transpose times the conjugate of w. Um, just you know, for a more specific example, if I have like one comma three i comma one plus two i, and I take the inner product of that in itself, right? How would that work? Hey, Luke? Mm -hmm. Can we see this? Yeah. So this would be what? This would be 1, 3i, 1 plus 2i. And then I multiply that by the conjugate of this vector, which would be 1 minus 3i and 1 minus 2i. What is? That's the definition of conjugate. Okay. You just change i to minus i, essentially. So any i you change to minus i? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. As far as I know, as far as I can think of, all of the examples I know, that's what conjugation amounts to. Even when it appears in a non-trivial sense, like if you ask me what's the complex conjugate of the imaginary exponential, even though i isn't really appearing in the linear sense, it's still true that that's e to the minus i theta. Now, there may be some place where changing i to minus i is in conjugation, but I don't know it. So, as a careless and somewhat universal comment, it's true, but as a mathematician, it worries me because I haven't proven it's true in general. I mean, anything. I don't think it's true in general. I think there's some stupid example you can come up with where changing to minus i is not the conjugation, but most things it is. All right, I'm digressing. So this is 1 squared plus 9 plus 1 squared plus 2 squared. Because what you really have is the, the, the um, basically just the length squared of each element. And the length squared of 1 is 1. The length squared of 3i is 9. The length of 1 plus 2i squared is 5, is, is 1 plus 4. So there you go. As you can see, that's a real number. 10, 11, 15. So therefore, we'd say that the length of v is the square root of v with v. And that makes sense. Why? I mean, there's something to worry about here, right? In principle, I told you this inner com this region inner product is complex value, right? And yet I'm using inequalities willy-nilly, like that means something. But as you know, complex numbers are not ordered, right? I can't say what, you know, is one greater than i? Me. The answer is no, that question doesn't make I mean it doesn't make sense. At least this much is true. There is no ordering of the complex numbers which is consistent with the algebraic structure thereof. There is an ordering of the complex numbers, so I mean you can't put an order relation on it, but it's not consistent with the algebraic structure of complex numbers, so it's kind of like something that topologists would care about. Everybody else, okay, that's why it's But anyway, <coughs> can I ask a question of that? 
Yeah. So, <laughs> and complex numbers then, there's no like, if you're doing average, there's no greater than or less than or like anything like that, I guess? There's no, there's no order to them? Well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, there's no linear ordering on it like the reals, right? And the reals, you know, it's in bijective correspondence with the line, so you can tell left or right or up or down, depending how you like think of it, you know? Yeah. But complex is plain, so. I mean, the best thing we have, the closest thing we have to an ordering is we can think about the distance from the origin, right? So we still can make argument about how long a complex number is, how far apart you are. That's useful, okay. but not numbers themselves. Um, at least not in the standard sense. So um, <clears throat> anyway, so this complex inner product space is the definition. Moving along, you define the length to be the square root of v with v. That makes sense because v with v is what? It's real, right? You notice what happens when you put x and x here? See what happens there? What does it mean if a number is conjugate to itself? It's a real number. It's a real number, yeah. So that with x and y equal says that x is that the inner product of x with x is real. Consequently, defining the length to be the square root of the inner product of the vector with itself makes sense. Okay, so this is a uh, complex inner product space in brief, and now we'll study some things about it. So um, we can still define. What can we still define? Pretty much everything we just did, right? And you still have, let's see here. Still makes sense, but still makes sense. Let's go down our laundry list of things we did over our end with Interpol. So we did. And we did a lot of things, didn't we? We defined orthonormality, right? So first of all, we still say two complex vectors are orthonormal if their complex inner product is product of delta ij. Um, we still use, by the way, vw equals to zero. That is, if, you know, that says that the uh, vec the set with v and w is or is what orthogonal, right? So that's still the same. Probably should put this one first and that one second. Oh well. Um, you still have the Gram-Schmidt algorithm. You can still run that thing because. That wasn't, I mean, this, this, this funny conjugation thing doesn't mess it up, right? We still have the notion of orthonormality. We still can do Gram-Schmidt. We, um, we can still prove that um, the complex inner product space is equal to a vector space, direct sum with its perf. The perf is still defined in the same way, you know. I suppose I haven't really proved that for an arbitrary vector space with an arbitrary inner product. I mean, to be more accurate, I guess I could say that the complex n space, the proof we did for our n, probably, I mean, I think it's reasonable to say it generalizes for complex n space without too much changing. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's, you know, just a re brief recap. We saw all that. Um, now I need to start telling you a few things about something, a special kind of transformation, right? So in problem 120 in your homework, uh, <clears throat> Can I give a question for you in these notes? Yeah, sure. I guess I expected that to be like the square root of 15 squared, so it would come out to be 15. But the sum of squares isn't necessarily a square. Well, if it's, isn't it going to be yeah, the, the equals 15. Yeah. This, this vector has, has a rational length. It's okay. It happens. Even in real case, it happens, right? Like 1, 1 triangle, the length of the hypotenuse is not 2. I know that now. That was a joke. <laughs> I didn't get it. That's because you haven't seen my very horrible solution to a number three homework recently where I, uh, I proposed a new Pythagorean theorem which was um, <laughs> not, not Is that what we have to correct on our test? Yes. 
sort of like sometimes how you define a multiplication for our homework or different? <laughs> what? What's that? I don't know what you're talking about. Sometimes you'll do one of the questions where you like tell us about a new type of operation. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> you know, um, just skipping back to RN for a second here. In RN, we can have a linear transformation L, let's say from RN to RN. All right. And if you have such a linear transformation, such that, in particular, if we have L of X, comma Y is equal to x comma L of y. And here I'm just talking about the dot product. That says something about the matrix of such a transformation. So let's just suppose that L of x is equal to ax. And let's see what, let's see what this condition, what is this condition, um, what does that say about L, right? Um, or more generically speaking, you can ask a question, um, you know, for, you know, let's set L of AX. And so we're asking, you know, what is, so then the question becomes, what, what is AX comma Y equal to X comma AY? What's that say about A? Well, there's a simple little, a little lemma you can prove here. Lemma. And here it is, AXY. And again, this is just a dot product, okay? <coughs> I'm going to end on at the moment. A is a square matrix, n by n. Um, so AX is equal to X comma A transpose Y. Now, once I write that, you know, if the above is true for all XY, you can, you can pretty much expect that A is going to be equal to A transpose, right? And so that, that's the reason that a, major, uh, a linear transformation L, which satisfies this, this property that you can move it from one slot in the dot product to the other without changing the dot product. Such a, such a transformation is called symmetric. Right? Because it, in part, it has a symmetric matrix. Uh, now, the, the proof of the lemma, which then proves that, in fact, L is symmetric, right? because you can do this for all x and y, so you can take the basis and you can show the components of A and A transpose are the same by doing that. Um, <coughs> so what is this? This is, we got what, AX is the proof. So we have AX transpose Y, which is what? X transpose A transpose Y by sock shoes. And then you just regroup. So uh, just to be clear, what's on the other side is AXY. Okay, so this is a this is you know the connection between a so-called symmetric linear transformation on RN and a symmetric matrix, which we've studied some, right? We've studied symmetric matrices a fair amount, you know, using them in the homework problem, so forth and so on. They're particularly nice. So then the question is, what's the analog of symmetric matrices and symmetric linear transformations in a complex setting? All right. So I, I will, um, you know, I'm going to give you a definition essentially for um, for a complex in the product space, information in the product space. But you know, really, what we're mostly interested in is CN. So how many erase this? Is there no? Yeah, I have a. Question. Sure. Uh, that line, uh, second line, eight x y equals x a y. But, but the lemma y is x a t y. Right. So, if this is equal to x a y, then that implies what? That implies this is true for all x, right? So that implies then that a transpose y is equal to a y. But that's true for all y, so that implies that a transpose is equal to a c 
skipping a few details here that I wouldn't want you to skip if I asked the sum test. But the implies to make those rigorous, you just feed it in standard basis. You'll get columns are equal, and then you right? just use x and y being standard basis. You can actually fill out fill in the details. Okay, I'm gonna erase now. So in, in in the complex case. Definition. And he, he has this as a proposition, but I'm going to give it as a definition. If I have a, if I have a, um, let's use L, um, L, a linear transformation from a complex vector space to itself, right? And um, this is a, not just a complex vector space, it's a Hermitian inner, Hermitian inner product space. And if we have that L of D, comma W, is equal to B comma L of W for all B and W, then we say L is, well, it's, it's what's called self-adjoint. about CN, right? So if we think about L going from, say, CN to CN, then we can write L of B is equal to what? Like A, B, right? That's still true in complex. There's nothing particularly real about the arguments which led to the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. Matrix multiplication over the complexes works the same. Um, <clears throat> So then you can ask the question, what, is, what does self-adjoint mean for L? What does that say about the matrix of L? What does that imply about A? But before I, before I tell you that, I'm going to throw a little lemma. Here's a little lemma. The analog of the lemma I just did, it's that for, for CN with VW equal to V transpose W conjugate, in other words, the standard Hermitian. My knees are so stiff. <laughs> <laughs> if only there was space for you to stretch out your knees. <laughs> they have to stretch sideways? They have to stretch like with weight on them. With weight on them? Like standing up. Have you been exercising? <laughs> See, this is what comes of exercising. <laughs> you like me, don't exercise. I'm <laughs> just so old. Um, oh, your knees are just so old? Yes. <laughs> Maybe you can cut that from Scrano. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Scrano is just a cautionary tale about college sports. <laughs> your body. Okay, sorry. I guess that paper's full. Fine. You got me there. Um, for some reason, it's hard to make being smart pay for school these days. I, don't know. I know, right? Some of that. Are too many smart people? Like free Are too right? many smart people? Oh, you only one. Okay. That 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 you're 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 just you're you're tempting me with that. That was <laughs> that was deliberate. That was calculated. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, smart Wait, what were you going to say? That was calculated. <laughs> no, Don't I'm give him that much credit. No, no, I need that. Hey, sure. I'm just handling <laughs> <laughs> So, for C with the inner product, it's a standard provision inner product. Um, we have this identity. And this is true for arbitrary matrices. And by complex matrices, A, B, W is equal to B, A, <coughs> star. W. Now, in physics literature, usually this star is denoted dagger. Or like an upside down sword. Um, a dagger. Now, what that actually is, is the conjugate of the matrix that's done component wise. Take the conjugate of each component one at a time. And then you transpose that thing. The conjugate transpose. Okay. The so-called Hermitian adjoint.
Now, you could also define the Hermitian in a joint of a linear transformation. You would just say that the Hermitian in a joint of a linear transformation is a new linear transformation such that the matrix of that transformation is the Hermitian in a joint of your original transformation. All of this done with respect to some orthonormal basis in the Hermitian inner complex space. That's in the model a little. Let me, let me not, we don't really need all that. Let me just focus here on this. So how do you prove this? It's not complicated, really. It's almost the same proof I just gave you. So if I look at, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you what I was talking about, the proof making it a little more careful. Um, let's do this with respect to the, the standard basis. Let's use the I and the J. So if I look at, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't do that. I'll stick with, my, stick with what I have. A, B, W, um, So that's A, B transpose, W conjugate, right? And then I use what? Fox shoes, B transpose, A, con uh, A transpose, W conjugate. But you see, in order to group, the A and the W so that they become the thing that goes in the second slot of the Hermitian inner product. I have to I have to put the I have to put the conjugate over the A, right? So how do you how do you make conjugates where there are none? Conjugate of a conjugate. Yeah, the conjugate of the conjugate is just the thing again. So like this is just I can already do this. This is bar bar. So A bar bar is just A. I mean A transpose bar bar is just A transpose. And so then I can group these parentheses, right? That's A transpose conjugate W. Still not right. A transpose conjugate parentheses, all of that conjugate. <coughs> And that's what? That's V A Hermitian conjugate W. to be this. In other words, you can put conjugate component-wise. And you can prove that if I have a product of two matrices, M and N, and I conjugate them, it's just M conjugate, N conjugate. There's no, it doesn't sock shoes. It just, it just stays with the with multiplication like that. So I can use that over here in the case of matrix column multiplication. The conjugate of the product is just product to conjugates in the same order. Unlike transposition. Not true for all conjugates. But in the commutative case, it is. All right, I shut up. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then what? If we have that this, if in addition we have that, um, you know, A, D, I, W is equal to, uh, excuse me, J, let's say. And that was equal to uh, E I um, A E J for all the standard basis vectors. Then I have this identity, which says that this is, by the way, E I comma A Hermitian conjugate E J. <clears throat> I'm going to leave that up on the board here for a minute, and then come back to it. Yeah. Why does the W go from being conjugated to being not conjugated? Because the conjugates up here. But it's not anywhere for the next one. Right, that's the definition. See, what, what's here? Uh -huh. It goes there. I understand. In fact, it's not linear in, <laughs> it's not linear in the second slot. 
So sometimes people will say that the Hermitian inner product is, is sesquilinear. It's like one and a half times linear. It's, uh, I think it's additive in the second slot, but it's not homogeneous. For example, if I have V comma CW, I get C bar. <clears throat> That's one of the things that pops out of our axe here. All right, I'm getting off track here. Let me get back on track. Bring it out all the other time. Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, oh, this is happening. All right. So, we can prove the following. Theorem. If A is equal to A, um, you know, A is self-conjugate, if it's the matrix of a, of a, of a, um, Self-adjoint, rather, I should say, not self-conjugate. It's self-adjoint uh, linear transformation. If the, the uh, matrix is equal to the termination conjugate, then the eigenvalues of A are real. So here's proof. So I look at uh, A, let's say A, B equals to lambda B. All right, suppose you got an eigenvalue lambda. So there's some vector B, such that A, B equals lambda B. B is not zero. All right. And consider the following. So here I have A, A, B, uh, comma B. Right, that's equal to what? That's equal to B comma A Hermitian conjugate B, right? But hey, if A is self-adjoint, that's just B A B, right? So let's see here. This one then is what? This is B lambda B. But lambda in the second slot pulls out to what? This is lambda bar B B. If you'll allow me this Mangus style calculation, if you will. On the other side, we have this. It's just lambda v. It's in the first slot where we have linearity, and so lambda pulls out. So we get lambda v. Right? But this and this are just non zero real numbers. They're the length of v squared. Therefore, Lambda is equal to lambda bar. Therefore, lambda is real. So, self adjoint linear operators on a Hermitian inner product space have real eigenvalues. Self adjoint um, linear transformations that have self adjoint matrices have real eigenvalues. So self-enjoyed implies real life value for short. But we have more than this. We can also prove, we can also prove that the eigenspaces for distinct eigenvalues are perpendicular. Okay? So theorem. If, um, let's say mu is not equal to lambda, then E mu is perpendicular to E lambda, where E mu is the null space of A minus mu i, and E lambda is the null space of A minus lambda i. Right. And both of these are 
subsets of, uh, well, I guess subspaces technically, of CN in my current discussion. <coughs> Was it? No. So, then no, no, no. <clears throat> How do you prove this? Would you take the dot product of those two things to show that you can do it? Yeah, pretty much. So, let's let, um, let x be an element of u. Let y be an element of the lambda, both on zero, right? Because we already know zero is <laughs> perpendicular, everything else fine. You know what we do? Let's see, we do something like that. And we know that we need to take the dot product equal to zero, so we're trying to say that it's perpendicular. Right. To say that these are perpendicular means that if I take any vector in one and any vector in the other, the dot product of them is zero. Well, the inner product in this case is zero. So <clears throat> here's what you do, something like this. If I look at a x inner product of y, I get what? I get mu uh, x y pulling the mu out. If I look at On the other hand, if I look at, I can also do this, right? I can say a, a x y is equal to x comma a what? Oh, <laughs> I forgot a somewhat important um, qualifier for this theorem. We'll see why we need it very soon. So <laughs> this. Uh, <laughs> what do I do? Well, if this was equal to uh, what? A y. In other words, if A was uh, self-adjoint, right? If it was equal to um, its own Hermitian conjugate, why don't we write conjugate transpose, right? So. If this is equal to that, then I have what? Right? And then the lambda pulls out. But what do we know about lambda if A is equal to? If A is equal to A. Then lambda is real. Lambda is real, right? So I can just say that that's equal to lambda x, y. So then, see what I have? I have that this is equal to that, right? That's mu minus lambda parentheses times xy is equal to zero. But this is not equal to zero by assumption because they're distinct. So therefore, the inner product of x and y is zero. But x and y are arbitrary. That's showing that the eigenspaces are perpendicular. I do need what assumption now? Provided what? A is equal to its own conjugate transpose, right? A is self adjoint. Okay. linear transformation has the same matrix as the original one. So that means if A is the matrix of L, A is the matrix of the complexification of L, right? And if A is equal to A transpose, that means that the complexification's matrix is in fact self-adjoint. 
because the conjugation, A, A conjugate, is just A again, because A is a real matrix. So what we're doing applies to real symmetric matrices. These arguments show, in fact, that the eigenvalues of a real symmetric matrix are real. Right? And it also shows that distinct eigenvalues have perpendicular eigenspaces for a symmetric matrix. Not for an arbitrary matrix, but for a symmetric matrix. This is true. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I don't know. Um, so is that that's kind of why a real uh, like a symmetric matrix has all its eigenvectors and values that like you can use I guess or I think that's kind of super much. No, you're not. <laughs> you can find one. Um, and then that leads us to that leads us to our final theorem for the day. And so I'll keep it real this time. Suppose uh, A is an element of R n by n, and a transpose is equal to A, then there exists beta V1 to the Vn uh, orthonormal um, each V sub J satisfying A V J equal to lambda J V J or lambda J in the reals. In other words, there exists an orthonormal basis for a symmetric matrix. Now, I just showed you that the eigenvalues are real. If you look at the argument in chapter four, it's rather convoluted. The argument I gave here was stupidly simple because we lifted the argument up to the complex case. Now, the proof of this is basically by induction on uh, it's, it's, it's done by induction. Obviously, I don't have time for it. Um, and I, I must go on. So I, I'm sad that I must, I must present it. Can you have some I do. I don't think so. If we're going no. by quick factor. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure, we have zero minutes. Excellent. All right, so my number is zero. So, proof. <laughs> Eigenvector um, x1 <coughs> such that p of x1 is equal to lambda x1, right? And then set w equal to the span of x1, all right? Of course, if n equals 1, we're, this is going to be proved by induction on the dimension of the space. So the proof is by induction on the dimension of the space. If n equals 1, we're done. There's nothing really to do. However, suppose inductively um, you know, theorem true for maps t from, say, rk to rk. And, and of course, the, the t I'm talking about is you know, the matrix of T is playing the role of A in the theorem, okay? So I can state this theorem for a linear transformation. I'm moving up. So the theorem is true. If the theorem is true for maps from RK to RK, you can consider uh, basically a map from RK plus 1 to RK plus 1. All right? You pick an eigenvector. You pick an eigenvector, like, like I sat there, and then, so basically W is the span of X1, for X1 is an eigenvector, and then you have what? You have RK plus 1 is, is W, directs on W perp. Right? And so, essentially the argument is this, if you take T and restrict it to W perp, if you take T and restrict it to W perp, then this, can be viewed as a mapping from RK to RK. 
So the question is, is it reasonable to view T, um, again, T being a symmetric matrix, um, as, as restricting to, R, to W perp? In fact, you can prove that, um, you know, T, and essentially this is the argument, if you take X of TY, you get um, T of X, Y, because T is symmetric, but that's um, lambda times X, Y, because X is that specific. I, I think I was having X1 here, sorry. X1, X1, X1. X1 was the eigenvector. So pull that eigenvalue lambda, but then you get lambda X1, Y, and you know that this is equal to zero because we're doing this, let's see here, for y an element of w perp, right? Why is an element of w perp? That means the dot product of x, which is a w, with y, which is w perp, is zero, by construction of the perp. And so that's zero. And that shows you that t of y is also a w perp. And so you need that in order for the restriction to be viewed as a mapping from the subspace to itself. In other words, the restriction, um, w perp is a t invariant subspace, is what this condition means. All right, so P of W perp is a subset of W perp. And then, past that, <clears throat> the argument is just essentially that. So then the induction hypothesis kicks in. You have an orthonormal basis for the restriction. If you take that basis, you piece it together with X1, voila, you've got an orthonormal basis for the whole space. And that proves the induction step. And that's pretty much it. This argument um, is at the end, it is in chapter four of Yamano a little. It, it's not that hard to understand, but this theorem, I've tried to prove without this kind of thinking, just by direct matrix calculation, let me try to tell you it does not go well. I mean, the, I, this to me is a non-trivial theorem. <coughs> the other direction is easy. If you assume that you have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, it is pretty easy to show that A has to be symmetric. That direction of the theorem is a test question. But the forward implication, symmetric, implies the existence of orthonormal eigenbasis. That's, that's hard. That's the spectral theorem. And then last time I showed you what that means in terms of writing A, in terms of products of the eigenvectors and the transpose. So I will shut up on that, and I will start to do that in the general theory of eigenvectors. Sorry. Thanks for the extra time, Sharon. Okay. Don't try to scare you guys. Oh, are you going to